Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, this is the uh, 41st Annual Cancer Control Society Convention, Labor Day weekend 2013 at the lovely Sheraton Universal Hotel in, in Universal City, California. Uh, our next speaker is uh, someone that I've known, I don't know, almost 10 years. Uh, we, I think, I know he's been coming here for a long time. I think we really, we met and got to know each other at uh, one of the ACAM uh, meetings. And Dr. Amin Nizami, uh, very well educated uh, doctor. He's developed some outstanding protocols, uh, very, uh, very valid, but verifiable. And he's working on some things, and so I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I mean, just thank, thank you. you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Frank. Good afternoon, everyone. As Frank mentioned, I have a passion about what is the most challenging uh, problems of medicine, which is cancer. And the most challenging part in cancer I found to be genetics and the interaction of genes and what we call epigenes or the environmental influence on the genes expression. As we go through the slides, you will see how I try to elaborate more scientifically about the interaction and how these genes are influenced by what, by what we call epigenes. Uh, pretty much I am considered by others to be a scientist in this field as that's my expertise. And during the last few years, I have developed a new protocol, as uh, Frank mentioned, in treating patients with advanced cancer who uh, mainly have failed the other modalities and conventional treatments. I gave a lecture this, uh, in this seminar in 2010, three years ago, and back then, uh, I was trying to squeeze in many of the science for integrative cancer therapies. Um, tr today I try to be focused on the, on the topic and the subject of epigenetics, and obviously if anybody has questions about other uh, methods of treating cancer, including metabolic treatments that I do very commonly in my practice, as well as immune therapies, you can always check the website, it's up there www.allcancercare.com, allcancercare.com. And I have some uh, more information. Obviously, I do consulting for other physicians, uh, in fact, for some oncologists as well, um, in patients who have failed their standard treatments, and I try to come up with sort of a collaborative work with them to make sure that at the end of the day, we have patients who fully respond to the therapy. And, um, you know, looking back in 2010 compared to now, I was looking at the last three years and what really conventional medicine has offered us in the sense of new treatments. Uh, in 2011, there were, as far as I remember, nine new cancer drugs coming to the market that were approved by FDA, and in 2012, there were 16. Every day you have a new cancer therapy that, a, a new drug that is approved by FDA. And these drugs mainly have been studied only once. And majority of these studies lack um, significant statistical strength. In fact, some of these studies are just done once outside the US and on a limited number of patients. But since the industry is desperate and the patients are dying, more and more every day, the FDA is pushed by legislation to try to accommodate with new cancer therapies and try to approve any new drug. In that uh, sense, you know, we have still um, very few drugs that are really working. In fact, some of these drugs, when you look at the studies, it's more like a joke. They have uh, nine additional days increase in the progression-free survival, and the drug gets approved in an expedited fashion, uh, an accelerated fashion in the FDA. What does that tell you? It just tells you that, as I mentioned, there is political pull there from drug companies to get new drugs into the market. But in practice, these patients put their hope on what is called a new drug and a novel, innovative method of treating cancer, which doesn't worth a penny for the patient. At the end of the day, they're gonna die in the same amount of time. 
and they will face major toxicity of these drugs. Um, I was looking at one of these studies, actually, uh, nine additional days, I just told you, and the results were seen in less than 1% of patients. So out of 100 patients, 99 of them had no response to the therapy. The, the one that did only survived additional nine days, but guess what? This drug has 40% um, toxicity that are life-threatening, but it gets approved. So that's the conventional medicine in the last three years. New drugs, no outcome. As far as alternative therapies, I was here three years ago, and I'm also disappointed because the same things that were offered in alternative medicine in the conference that I were uh, attending back in 2003, they haven't changed either. And so the patients, again, put their hopes on something that majority of the, t majority of the time does not work. It may not be toxic as conventional therapies, but as far as the outcome, it doesn't really change the outcome. So what is my job here? As a physician who practices non-conventional cancer therapies, I personally have a desire to go after what's challenging. And in the field of medicine, I found cancer to be the most challenging part. And the challenge is to find what works, what therapy in conventional medicine in combination with what alternative therapy can change the patient's outcome. And in that sense, I've been successful in the last few years, as I said, with the support of my uh, advisory board, which we have oncologists, pharmacologists, we have um, many, many people who have a significant scientific background as well as um, legal background and financial background to support me in what I have been able to achieve, which I think is very extraordinary. When I see the patients, as you see these cases that I have treated, some of them had completely no hope in their lives, and they had responded um, not at all to the conventional or alternative medicine, and they get referred to me just by listen, hearing my lectures, in fact, or uh, word of mouth by somebody else that I treated, and some of them respond very beautifully beyond any kind of expectations that I have um, as far as uh, integrative therapies. So let's go over these quickly and see what we have achieved. You know, people also, um, I was asked uh, outside here about what is going on with the BRCA mutation. I just wanted to quickly uh, mention that BRCA gene, because it's a genetic, so it, it's my field, right? BRCA gene is basically involved in DNA repair, and so obviously when you have mutated or defected BRCA, you will have increased risk of DNA mutation, and you will have carcinogenesis. So uh, that's true. So when Angelina Jolie removed her breast, she had a point there. I'm not saying that, that that was completely clueless. But what she missed, and probably most of the people listening to this story continue to miss, is that BRCA is also involved in other organs uh, carcinogenesis besides breast. Well, most of you know that it's also involved with ovari ovarian cancer. And so uh, it's important to um, screen for that. Also, it's involved with uh, brain cancer. And the studies also show that it's involved with pancreatic cancer. And it's also showed that it's involved with stomach cancer and many other organs. So can you remove all of those? Can you remove your brain because you're at risk of brain cancer? No. Right? Or maybe conventional medicine says, let's, let's remove everybody's brain. <laughs> and there is another gene called P10 that is also involved in the DNA repair. Um, and it's in a higher level of BRCA. I wish I had more time, but there are ways that you can actually augment P10 as an oncosuppressor gene function and therefore you reduce the carcinogenesis and risk of cancer without removing your breast. And I wish I could have that discussion with Angelina Jolie before she did that. Okay, so my subject of the talk, multi-targeted epigenetic therapy, therapy or modified multi-targeted epigenetic therapy. It's called MTET. It's a little uh, background of who I am. Obviously, I work very uh, collaboratively with uh, conventional oncology establishments, both at the university basis, as well as National Cancer Institute and NIH. I have, have the pleasure of publishing in a variety of journals, and I try not to stay away from conventional establishment and journals, because I think that is the door to alternative medicine, to prove 
that what we have works. If we can't prove that what we have work, we better not even proceed it. So for me, my responsibility as a detective is to find out what alternative medicine really works and with what conventional medicine. So that's my life, 24 hour a day, to find out what's the answer. So this is conventional medicine. You know, some, an oncologist, I don't know if you guys heard this story with Dr. Feta or whoever, that in uh, Chicago, actually, Michigan, uh, she charged $128 million uh, worth of claim for Medicare for patients who he claimed that he, they have cancer. After the investigations from FBI, it was all over the news that many of these people who he treated and sold chemotherapy to their insurance companies, they didn't even have cancer. If one oncologist can make $128 million just by one person, I don't get it when alternative doctors are claimed that they're making money out of the patient. That's just ridiculous because the whole industry is actually going through a big challenge of, uh, as you know, politically, of what's going on and how much are they charging with the really high markups on the insurance companies for the chemotherapies that they don't work. So an oncologist that unfortunately lives in a box, prescribes in a box, and sees everything in a box. And we do have oncologists that are thinking outside the box. I do have oncologists that refer patients to me. I have oncologists that consult with me. I have oncologists who are part of my board. But this is what I have problem with, is with the people who live in the box and they don't see anything else. The concept of epigenetics. Um, how many of you, perhaps physicians in the audience, have heard about epigenetics or know some about it? Very good. So as you can imagine, the um, term of epigenetics, when I give lectures, this is how I express it. This is my tie. This is the gene that causes cancer, right? It's stuck in my neck, and I can't get rid of it. Nobody can. But the gene expression can change as the tie shape changes. So the DNA shape changes, and upon the change of the DNA shape, its expression also changes. And that's what epigenetic. Epigenetics is the expression of the DNA to the point that it can manifest in a different phenotype. So we'll talk about that. Epigenetics plasticity is not only involved in cancer, but it's also involved in normal physiological development. And so uh, when I was in MIT and Harvard Cancer Stem Cell Research uh, a few years ago, we had a full discussion about this with Dream Team, what they call USC, Dr. John Peters and uh, Dr. Balin at John Hopkins. Uh, we had this discussion. The discussion is about changing the DNA expression through drugs that they, that they have epigenetic modifications. So the term is not new since 1940. It's a well-established phenomenon that plays a big role in diversity of biological processes. And we are recognizing that our epigenetic inheritance systems through which non-DNA variations can be transmitted in cell organism uh, that changes the whole concept of um, the DNA mutation causing gene. In other words, it's a process that is reversible, and it's also inheritable. So through the different generations, you, and I see that all the time, you know, a patient comes to see me and they have lung cancer, and I ask them, have you smoked? And they say no. But I ask them, have your father smoked? And they say yes. So the father smoked, but the son is paying the price by changes in epigenes that passes through generations. Uh, butterfly and caterpillar. They have identical genes, but phenotype are different. So phenotypically, the DNA expression, just like remember my, my tie, changes, and it shows different manifestations, shows different diseases. And what my therapy does is that it changes the butterfly back to caterpillar. So what happened in your fetal stages that caused the DNA to start become carcinogenic we go back. We turn back the clock to the time that the patient was on fetal stages of development. And at that point, what happened to cause the cancer, we reverse it. So another slide, what your mother 
eight can determine your lifetime outcome through epigenetic mechanisms. And these are, um, epigenetics are not an alternative type of a medicine. I don't, I don't consider myself an alternative doctor because epigenetics is some, something completely science-based proven and it's absolutely defendable. When I pick up the call an oncologist, I can talk over his head because they have no idea of what's going on in the field of research in epigenetics because they're just clinicians. MTET. So we're going to go over some cases that I have treated. As you can imagine, PET scan shows the activity of the tumor versus CT scan shows the size of the tumor. So when I show the PET scans, keep that in mind that we are shutting down the metabolic activity of the tumor revealed in the PET scan. And that's what the MTET therapy does. So MTET inhibits carcinogenesis, metastasis, and the response to the therapy. MTET, remember what I talked about, carcinogenesis. So we reverse the time to the time that the cancer were mutated, right? We, we lower the chance of met uh, metastatic tendency of a cancer, and we also change the response to the therapy. So it has a synergistic effect with major almost all conventional treatments as far as radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery. This is one in vitro study that we did on our therapy. As you can see, it's a breast cancer cell line that we exposed it to nitrogen mustard as a chemotherapy. We tested all chemotherapies, and they had similar results. This is a sample, as you can see, the nitrogen mustard is the second bar. It's less than 3 KU, which is a kinetic unit of apoptosis. The higher, the better. Anything less than 4 means that the chemotherapy is completely ineffective. When you add nitrogen mustard, which was completely ineffective in this cancer cell line, you see that number three goes to 36. Ten times or tenfold increase in the efficacy of chemotherapy. So somebody who has failed chemotherapy, you try it again with the same chemotherapy, and this time responds with our therapy. Case one is a 54-year-old who actually had ERPR positive hair to negative breast cancer, several uh, um, uh, recurrences. She failed hormonal therapy. She failed mastectomy. She failed all other modalities of care. She came and refused chemotherapy. And she also had kidney cancer and appendiceal cancer. As I said, you know, the, the old concept of type of cancer, location of cancer, is outdated because ovarian cancer may share the same genetics as lung cancer, may share the same genetics as breast cancer. It's all about genetics. So when a drug comes out and says, this drug is for non-small cell lung cancer, okay? But we, but we use it as an off-label usage for pancreatic cancer, right? Many of those are. So the reason is that they share the genes. The epigenetics are involved in 90 to 95% of tumors. So this patient got treated, and I don't have time to go over all these um, PET scan details, but I'll show you how she responded so beautifully just by our treatment, and uh, she was the one that actually failed hormonal therapies. This time, responds, if you can see the PET scan, both size as well as activity of the tumor in all lesions dropped to almost complete remission. She has almost physiologic activity in all her tumor. And that's a stage four breast cancer that I have treated. This is the PET scan before. This is the PET, you see the activity of the tumor in the chest, hilar, pericarinal uh, lymph nodes. And this is after, completely clear. You see those big lesions, they're very active. So if you look at these spots here, you see how bright they are, these two, are very active. The SUV activity of the tumor was very high. And then you look at the PET scan after therapy. Nothing. No chemotherapy. We measure stem cell activities through fibroblast growth factor 2. And as you can see, the uh, hairs were really up there. They normalized. PET scan, all these numbers came down. Case 2. History of right infiltrating lobular carcinoma of the breast in 2012. She tried low dose uh, IPT. You know, you've heard of insulin potentiation therapy. I've been trained in it. I don't practice it. I don't believe in it. IPT is using low dose chemotherapy in patients after injections of insulin. Insulin itself can increase the growth of cancer. 
I don't have time to go through that. She failed the IPT. She used five or six different chemotherapies. None of them worked, and in fact, she got worse. And you see that after she came to my office, she, had, she was from Dallas. She couldn't breathe. She had three liters of fluid in her pleural space that had to be removed every week. Three liters. After the therapy, zero. That three liters weekly turned out to be nothing. Completely eradicated pleural malignancy. All the tumor markers dropped. This is before therapy. Look at that. This is a patient who had not ever even done mastectomy. She had the primary tumor at the site. She never did mastectomy. The primary tumor, which occupied all four quadrants of the breast, completely shut down after therapy. Nothing. This is the breast. Breast is still there. There's no mastectomy done. And it's very active. And you see the pleural effusion. All this that you see there is pleural effusion. It has collapsed the right lung after therapy. Nothing there, no pleural effusion. Just my treatment. Before, after. Two more markers. Look at the trend. When she came, up there, down here. Stem cell activity, VEGF, LDH, CRP, circulatory tumor cell, zero. Case three, 75 year old with a history of prostate cancer. He refused chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation. When he came to my office, he couldn't walk. He had extensive bony metastatic lesions everywhere in her back. We started the treatment. After three days, he was pain free. He had no narcotics on board. He could walk. He didn't even remember he had cancer. This guy amazingly respond. MRI, CTs, everything confirmed the response. In fact, these slides, I did not even prepare these images. The radiologist prepared these images, and I did that intentionally because I wanted these cases to be reviewed independently. And so I'm not mm, cherry picking. PSA drop. No metabolic, no metabolic activity. All these metastatic lesions had completely no metabolic activity. We rebiopsied the prostate. And the biopsy showed that out of nine lesions that he had in prostate, eight of them were completely responded. And there was only one left with no physiological, you can see, physiologic activity. You can't do this with chemotherapy. Even if, if the chemotherapy works, you can't get here. The scan, again, now have physiologic metabolic activity. No longer metabolic activity is seen. All the metastatic lesions, completely gone. Bladder was involved. Bones were involved. Pelvic wall was involved. Every, uh, iliacs, everything was involved there. In this poor guy, after the treatment, he doesn't even remember he has cancer. Before, you see that? Very active lesions in the bone. After, nothing. Three years after treating this guy, his PSA was still normal. And it was on maintenance treatment once a month, which he didn't even come. What I'm trying to tell you is that epigenetics can change, reverse the genetic manifestation of mutation. It can reverse it. Case four, I don't know if I have time to go all, through all this. I tried to do one more. 80, 88 years old, uh, she failed, what, 10, 12 chemotherapies, nothing worked for him. Bre her breast cancer, as you can see, on platinum taxol, gemcitabine, uh, navalbine, doxorubicin, nothing worked. This is her, these are the treatments. Her circulatory, okay, look at the circulatory tumor cell. Circulatory tumor cell is a test that um, correlates with survival. So if you want to do a blood test on a patient with stage four that correlates with how long they're going to live, you can do that. In this patient, it was 24 before the therapy. You can look at the dates. This was April 2011, April 4th, 2011. It was 24. Anything more than five correlates with four months of overall survival. Anything more than five correlates with four months of survival. And hers was 24. 
So she could die any day. After the therapy, zero. And this is what? April 25th. After 21 days of treatment, her circulatory tumor cells dropped from 24 to zero. We completely eradicated the cancer in the blood. The PET scan confirmed the response. Non-active. Um, I'll try to wrap it up. Case uh, five again. Um, all these scans, K6, um, malignant melanoma. I want you to see these pictures. This is malignant melanoma. Look at the picture. This is Monday when I see this patient. She did not do any chemotherapy or any other interferon or interleukin or any other therapy for melanoma. Nothing. Biopsy confirmed that all these lesions are cancer. Friday, after five days of treatment. Look at that. Malignant melanoma. K7, um, breast cancer again. Responded. Okay. I'm so on time, my God. <laughs> I think that uh, some of your therapies and your protocols are as good as your timing on your lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>